Thank you. Yeah, so thanks to the organizers for organizing this conference. It's a pleasure to be back in Vienna in person. So I will uh, report today on joint work with Zijong Huang, which is also in the, in the room. With Zijong Huang. So I know my handwriting is very bad, so do not hesitate if you cannot read or if I need to, to write bigger, I can try, no promises. But. Uh, so, yeah, I will talk today about the local distribution of rational point, a local version of Manin's conjecture, and what the circle method might have to, to say about that. So, in the first part of the talk, I will introduce this uh, local version of Manin's conjecture, which was proposed by Emmanuel Père and two of the students, Pajlo and mainly uh, Zijong Huang, and uh, try to motivate this uh, local version of the conjecture and to, yeah, to show why this is really interesting and maybe why it hasn't received enough attention until now. Then I will state the known results and then I will finally arrive to our uh, theorem and if time permits, I will sketch uh, some ideas in the proof. So let me uh, recall a few things about Manning's conjecture that we've already seen uh, previously this, uh, this week. So let V be a smooth fan of variety. So we can relax uh, this condition, but for the purpose of this talk, this will be enough. And uh, we are interesting. We are interested in counting the number of uh, rational points of bounded height on uh, such a Fano variety. So Manning, in the late 80s, formulated the following conjecture, which uh, which is that uh, if you take this smooth Fano variety and if you assume that uh, it has a rational point, also a set of rational points in its Tariski dense, uh, we have there exists should exist a thin subset T of uh, the set of rational points such that if you count the number of points of points in uh, V of Q outside of this thin subset of heights less than B. I didn't specify here, but I will choose all along uh, during this talk anti-canonical uh, height, where H is here is an anti-canonical uh, height. Then the prediction of Manin is that this should be equivalent to some constant, which received an interpretation by Emmanuel Per, and you probably saw that in, in the talk of uh, Florian, times uh, B times some power of log B. And the power of log B should be to the row minus one, where row, supposed to be the rank of the Picard group of V. So this conjecture is known for quite uh, many cases uh, and many people worked on, on this conjecture. And usually what people do is they choose a specific choice of height, which is convenient for the computation and they manage to prove such an asymptotic formula. But actually we expect uh, much more than this, just this result to be true. So define, for u inside the set of rational points, the measure delta ub, which will be the sum over all p in u of height less than b, and you put here a delta p, where delta is the Dirac measure at p. Then the prediction, which was, I think, for for the first time formulated by Per, is that we should expect some equidistribution of this uh, measure. So we expect that there exists the same thing, a thin subset. So I am under the same assumption that I'm looking at the smooth Fano variety, a thin subset, P, such that if you normalize by the number of points in V of Q, outside of T of height less than B. This measure delta UB, it should converge weakly to some uh, limit measure. In some sense, you should expect equidistribution of uh, the rational points with respect to some limiting measure. The measure uh, will be in uh, the set, the Brauerman in set uh, of uh, V. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so a few more words about this measure. I mean, this is well understood. I mean, we have a precise prediction on what to expect here. And this measure, uh, mu b per hour, is, uh, can be written as a product over all places of q of some uh, measure mu b nu, where mu nu b is a measure on the q nu point uh, of v. So this gives you a measure on the Adel uh, space, and then you get a measure on this set by restriction. Okay, so this is what we uh, expect. Or maybe I should specify what I mean by weekly convergence. Also, remark. A weekly convergence. We mean that for all f sufficiently nice, so continuous and bounded typically would would be enough. And in some cases, you can restrict to characteristic function of intervals. Um, we should have at the integral so f yeah, so the integral of f against the measure uh, b lambda u b should converge when b goes to infinity to the integral of f against the limiting measure. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, the first version of the principle of Manin's conjecture was well studied, but this version we have a very much few, uh, very few cases of this conjecture which is known. What is known? So this is known for projective spaces. Then this is known for um, flag varieties, generalized flag varieties. So inside here you would get the Grassmannians, but you will also get quadrics with a smooth quadric with a rational point. This will also be uh, known for F, for V smooth hypersurface. Uh, of Pn of degree d when n is bigger than 2 to the d times d minus 1. So this can be deduced uh, from the work of Birch, um, where he was using the circle method to study such hypersurfaces. So this is due to kind of Birch, probably written uh, in the setting of equidistribution by Emmanuel Per, and this is using the circle method. And we also have a few uh, equivalent compactification of groups. Compactification of groups. So the list of examples is much uh, thinner than the list of examples for which we know uh, Manin's conjecture for a specific height. So now we'll just mention briefly why we should expect such an equidistribution. So, <laughs> So we expect such an equidistribution for the following reason. I mean, if you believe Manin's conjecture, there are good reasons that you should believe equidistribution. Because if you can prove Manin's conjecture for all the height associated to the anti-canonical line bundle, then you can deduce equidistribution. And conversely, if you have equidistribution and Manin's conjecture for one height, then you can deduce Manin's conjecture for all the height associated to the line bundle. Somehow, if you're convinced that Manin's conjecture should be true, then you should expect equidistribution. Okay, uh, now I think before going any further, I'd like to show a few examples of um, distribution of rational points on some very simple varieties. And we'll see that uh, Manning's conjecture and the global equidistribution that is predicted by Emmanuel Per doesn't uh, explain everything that we see. I'll turn off the lights. The first example here is P2. Let me write it somewhere. So here you're looking at points 
in P2 of heights uh, less than, well, I forgot the number, I think it's less than 30 or something like that. So here you're looking P2. And uh, how is this picture drawn? So this picture was uh, made by Emmanuel Per. So take this point Q001 and you take uh, the, affine, the, the affine chart given by Z, uh, not zero. So you send this point to zero, zero. So here in the middle, you have this point Q and all of the other points, you see them through this chart and you get this uh, distribution. So you can see that you have global equidistribution, but you also can see that uh, the point seems to get closer to Q uh, following rational lines through uh, Q. And the second thing that you notice is that you have uh, holes. So I guess it's a bit high, but around the central point, you don't have too many rational points of height less than B. Seems to be some uh, repulsion between, between the two. So this is actually uh, kind of easily explained. If you take O1 instead of the anti-canonical uh, line bundle here in P2 cross P2, the height is just, if you take co-prime integer coordinates, you'll have the maximum that X, y of X, Y, Z has to be less than B. And what we're trying to understand is why we have this hole around Q in, in this picture. So you want to take a rational point which will get closer to uh, Q here. So when you take the point on uh, this chart, what does it mean to get close to Q? A point P is close to Q if the maximum of X over Z and Y over Z is uh, small. So this is the image of this point uh, through this chart and you want that to be close to zero, zero. So what's the maximum, uh, the minimum distance that you have to respect if all X, Y, and Z are less than B, X over Z and Y over Z cannot be um, smaller than B uh, minus one. So this has to be bigger than B minus one. So this explains why we have this hole uh, of size B minus one around the central point here in this picture. And I will restate uh, this inequality in another way because this will be useful later when we're introducing new, new objects. So here this tells you that the height, the distance, sorry, from P to Q times the height of P has to be somehow uh, bigger than one. If you think of B as the height, you get the distance times the height, which is bigger than one. Okay, so the second example I uh, would like to look at is also provided by Emmanuel Per. And this is uh, this time P1 cross P1. Uh, okay, maybe I can write here. So this is P1 cross P1. And here we, we have taken Q is 0, 1 cross 0, 1 and we take the obvious chart, and we send this point to zero. And you also see the same kind of phenomena. You have some, you have not too many rational points around the central point, whereas equidistribution would predict that you should fill all the holes. And so we'd like to understand why on the vertical and horizontal lines you have points closer to Q, and why outside of these lines you're further away from Q. So actually here, we'll do the same kind of reasoning. I will use the height associated to O11, which gives you the max of X, Y times the max of S, T, which has to be less than B for a point X, Y and S, T in P1 cross P1. And so here you can do the same reasoning. You want a point to be close to Q and you want to see what uh, does it impose uh, on the distance from um, P to Q. So what we want is to study, uh, what can we say about the size of X over Y and S over T. So it's not too hard to see that if you take a vertical line or the horizontal line, one of these two factors disappears and you're back with the height of P1 with uh, O1. So you get, again, using the same reasoning, that the, height, the distance has to be greater than b to the minus one. So, okay. so for points on the horizontal and vertical line, the 
you get the same thing. The distance from P to Q times the height has to be bigger than one. Now, if you take another point, which is not on the vertical lines, you will really have a product here. And so you want the product of the two to be less than B. So it's not too hard to see that these quantities would be uh, of size B to the minus one half. Outside, you get that the distance to, from P to Q has to be bigger roughly than B to the minus one half, which is bigger than B to the minus one. So this is consistent with what we're seeing. And we can rewrite this as the distance from P to Q squared times the height has to be bigger than one. All right, so this simple calculation seems to explain somehow a little bit what's going on. And this kind of inequalities will show up uh, later uh, in the talk and will be uh, of crucial importance. Uh, okay, I think that's all I wanted to show you. So following these observations, uh, Zizhong uh, Huang, uh, proposed a way of trying to understand this local behavior that we are missing from the, from the global uh, version of Manning's conjecture. Hmm. So here's the setting, so I should write there. local version of Manin's conjecture. So this was introduced by Zizhong Huang and also Manuel Perrin and Bachelot. To fix what we're gonna do, we're gonna fix a rational point on our smooth fan over ATQ. And we're gonna try to understand how rational points on Q approach uh, this, uh, on V, sorry, approach Q. So to do that, Choose a local geomorphism. To local row from the set of real points to the tangent space of V at the point Q that you can see as R to the dimension of V. Okay, and we impose a condition that Q has to be sent to zero. So here in the previous examples, you can think of this as the local chart we were choosing. Um, okay, so now what we want to do. So let's take any u inside v of q. Let's add the condition that it has to contain uh, q. And we will choose r, strictly uh, bigger than one, I guess. No, bigger than zero, which we will call the zoom factor. And what will we uh, try to understand? We will try to understand the following uh, measures. Um, define measure we will call delta, so it depends on quite a lot of stuff. Depends on u, on r, on v, and on q. By uh, the fact that the integral of f against this measure has to be the sum over all points in U of height less than B times F to the B over one over R rho of X. So roughly what are we doing here? We are looking at points in U of height less than B and we are only counting points which are close to our point Q up to a factor b to, the mi b to the minus one over r. So if you think of the two previous examples, where are they? Yeah, here. You see that if you take r to be less than one, you, have, you will find this hole around the central point on the picture. Whereas where r is bigger than one, you will find uh, a lot of rational points. And the same for P1 plus P1. If you take R to be less than one, you will find nothing except Q. If you, find, if you take R between one and two, you will find only the horizontal and vertical lines. And R bigger than two, you will find all the points. Uh, the economy are less. 
here. So are there questions? Yeah. Sorry? The local, yeah, I mean, you just want to define locally the ranking. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Neighborhood of the animal. I mean, yeah, here we're just saying that locally around the point, this variety looks like the tangent plane, tangent space, and here we, we use a distance on here to... Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, sorry, thank you. Okay, so the question Zizong Huang tried to answer in his uh, PhD thesis is what to expect for this uh, kind of measure. And we have a weekly convergence to something. So heuristically, what you would expect is, um, I'm missing my papers. Yeah, so I guess heuristically, what you would expect is that if R is very small, you're taking a very strong zoom because we have this one over R. So somehow you would expect, yeah. so you would expect that to find nothing except the point Q, you're zooming around. So if R is small, very small, you expect to find that this would converge weakly towards uh, the Dirac at the point Q. On the other uh, side of the spectrum, if R is uh, very big, then uh, you expect the zoom to be very weak, so you expect somehow uh, to find the global situation back, so you would expect uh, equidistribution with respect to some measure uh, with support, uh, will be, whose support will be of dimension, uh, the dimension of V. And it's not really clear what happens uh, in the middle. But maybe to make things more clear, I can write uh, what happens for P2 and P1 cross P1 that we just uh, saw earlier. So what happens for P2? For P2, if you take the uh, zoom factor to be less than one, you did in get, in you did you, indeed get uh, the Dirac measure uh, at Q, as expected. If R is strictly bigger than one, then you get some uh, equidistribution. I don't want to write the, the precise formula, but you, you have a constant time dz dw, where dz and dw has a Lebesgue measure on R2. And what's interesting is that if you take R is equal to one, you take, uh, you obtain a measure uh, supported on uh, rational lines through Q. Somehow it precisely uh, shows the behaviors that we were uh, seeing in the picture. If the zoom is too uh, strong, you get just Q. This tends to show that the points are going to uh, approach Q along the rational lines, passing through Q, and then when the zoom is too uh, weak, you get some equidistribution again. Now, what happens for P1 cross P1? So for P1 cross P1, the situation is a bit more complicated, but when R, when R is uh, less than one, you get once again the Dirac measure at Q. Then, when R is between one and two, you get a measure supported on the vertical and horizontal line. The 
which is once again consistent with the observation and the small calculations that we've done over there. Because the zoom is too strong, uh, so you're missing all the points that are at the distance b to the minus one half that we've uh, seen uh, earlier. Then for r is equal to two, you get uh, uh, a two-dimensional measure, which is absolutely continuous with respect to the to the Lebesgue measure. I actually, I think I can actually write it. You you get something like that for some function. Uh, G, which is interesting because it kind of explains the hyperbolic behavior that you can see on the picture. Okay, so we're trying to find prediction. I mean, what Dijon uh, Huang did in his thesis was to try to find prediction for this thing. So how can we make a, somehow a precise conjecture? So I'll mention without been too long. Uh, okay, so maybe I'm forgetting in everything I've done here, I forgot the normalization factor. Of course, because you have infinitely many new points, so you want the power of b times the power of log b. Sorry. But I'm going to explain what power of b we expect and what power of log b. Somehow the first naive guess would be if you believe in equidistribution that if you're counting, so if you're taking, so where is it? Uh, it's here. So if you're taking here f, the characteristic function of some ball, maybe I should say that before actually. First remark, it suffices to deals, deal with uh, indicator function of uh, some balls from properties of the weak convergence. So what we actually uh, want to do, we actually want to estimate in order to answer the local uh, version of Manin's conjecture, the number of points, which will be in U, of height less than B, and such that the so row of X lies in uh, the ball of uh, zero, e to the minus one R at E. So if you believe in equidistribution, so this should, uh, somehow look like what you get in Manin's conjecture times some limiting measure. And here you would expect the volume of this uh, thing. And the volume of this thing, it's not too hard to see that it will give you a b to the minus the dimension of b over r. So in the end you expect something, not equal, but same order, b to the one minus the dimension of v over r times some power of log b times some measure. So it turns out that this prediction uh, has been uh, verified in a few cases by Zhizong uh, Huang, and he also has heuristics using deformation theory that seems to suggest that this should be the correct power. But here, uh, it's not always the rank of the Picard group you get another exponent, so Dijon also has a precise conjecture on that. I don't want to talk about it because in the cases of our theorem, we won't have any powers of log b. And the main difficulty is uh, then to predict this measure. We don't have really a good idea of what measure, which measure we, we should expect here. 
I mean, already the case of P1 and P2 shows that it can be very, very complicated. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, so I should mention that Dijon uh, Huang proved this, um, I mean, studied this problem for a few uh, toric varieties in his thesis and after. So he managed to compute uh, the limiting measure uh, in, in some cases. Now, I would like to make a little detour uh, using Diofontaine approximation. Because we will need to use some uh, tools from Diofontaine approximation, which is not uh, completely surprising because we're trying to approach rational points by other rational points. We could actually try to do the same question by fixing a point in V of Q bar instead of V of Q and see what's, what's happening. So, so that you get a sense of the objects I will define later, I would like to uh, recall a famous uh, problem because this will be a generalization of this problem. So this is a, uh, the problem of finding for any uh, theta in R, you want to find the supremum of all the mu strictly positive such that the inequality T over Q minus theta is less than one over the height of P over Q to the mu has infinitely many solutions. So this is a very classical uh, problem in infinitely many solutions. So this is a very cl classical problem in the Ophentine approximation. It measures how well theta can be approached by uh, rational points. And it uh, was proven pretty quickly uh, that if theta is rational, mu of theta is one. And if theta is not rational, so it was uh, known uh, by Dirichlet that mu of theta was bigger than two, and the main challenge was to prove an upper bound. This was uh, done by uh, Ross, who showed that you get uh, actually two. Ross and I guess Dirichlet. And so, yeah, so the, the things I will define now are inspired with these little calculations here, and are actually generalization of this uh, Diophantine approximation problem. Yes, right, yeah, thank you. Okay, so now I will define generalization of this, and we should expect that this generalization of this Diophantine uh, approximation problem should give some, uh, some elements in order to predict the limiting measure for the local distribution. So, define for u a sub variety, so you can take it either closed or open here, uh, of x of v, sorry, uh, alpha q of v, so of u. We'll call that the best approximation on u, best approximation of q on u as the supremum of the gamma strictly positive, such that there exists a constant, bigger than zero strictly, uh, such that the distance from P to Q to the gamma times the height of P has to be bigger than C for all P in U of uh, Q minus Q. Okay, so we should maybe also assume that Q is in U. So somehow, if you compute these things for P1, you will find the inverse of um, one, you will find one over mu. So the reason is what is why? Is because here you have the exponent on the height, and here we put the exponent on the distance. But mainly it's really a generalization of that. If you take P1, you get one over mu. 
Okay, and so this is somehow a measure on how well approximated is Q by rational points on U. All right, so let's give some examples. So if you take the same Q as earlier and P2, alpha Q uh, of P2, so the computations we did earlier shows you that this is one. And alpha Q of P1 cross P1 shows you that this is two. So somehow for P2, we find one, which is precisely here, the value of the zoom factor on which you have a jump on the dimension of the support of the measure. For P2, we get two, where is P2? P2 is here. So for two, you also get a jump, but it doesn't suffice to explain all the cases because we also have a jump for R is equal to one. And what's interesting is that for P2, if you compute the best approximation constant along the horizontal line or the vertical line, you get one, which is precisely the other jump. So somehow we might expect that if you find a sub variety, so this is a principle, so if you have, uh, let's say yeah, U inside of V such that alpha Q U is closed, alpha Q U is strictly less than alpha Q V, you might expect that uh, if the zoom factor is uh, too small, you will miss the points, some points from V, but you will only get the points approaching Q uh, on U, on your sub variety. So that's why uh, Zijon calls this uh, closed sub varieties locally accumulating uh, varieties. We call such a U locally accumulating uh, sub variety. So somehow for P1, you were looking for the locally accumulating sub variety, you get the one, and how do you get the two? Well, you have to allow yourself to remove some closed subset to get the second jump. So this leads to the following definition, which we will call the generic approximation. We put alpha essential of Q this will be the supremum over all U open and dense of alpha Q U. Somehow in doing that, you will allow yourself to remove these locally accumulating sub varieties. And somehow you would expect that if R is bigger than this, you should get uh, equidistribution, which is precisely what we uh, get in the case of P2 and P1 cross P1. So somehow this best approximation constant and this generic approximation constant seem to uh, give you elements on uh, where you should get jumps on the dimension uh, of the measure, the limiting measure. Okay, so w one thing that is actually not clear is that how to compute those things. Uh, it's actually very hard to compute and we have very few examples um, on a variety on which we can actually compute them and uh, we do not expect it to be finite all the time. McKinnon has a result where under some assumptions like Voita's conjecture and some, some other assumptions that I, I forgot, he, he expects that the essential constant might be infinite. Okay, so these constants are uh, interesting to compute for our problem, but it's difficult to compute them. But still I will give a few elements on how we can get information on them. And this is uh, linked with the rational uh, curves on your variety uh, passing through Q. So this constant also have a geometric uh, interest. Way too long. So I'll be, be quick on, on this. So if you word on how to compute those uh, constant and how they relate to rational uh, curves going through your fixed point. 
So there is first a conjecture due to McKinnon. And uh, so don't miss any hypothesis. So if you assume that you have at least a rational curve on V passing through Q, then you expect that there should be a rational curve C on V passing through Q such that the best approximation constant is actually realized on this rational uh, curve. So somehow you expect uh, locally uh, that point will accumulate only on a rational uh, curve. So there, there are a few elements in favor of this conjecture, but I don't really have time to, to say anything more. But this is the first uh, link with rational curves. The second, the second, sorry, the second uh, link is the following. So as I mentioned here, it's, it was very challenging to get an upper bound. So here, since we uh, roughly have one over mu, this is difficult here to get a lower bound. But for upper bounds, we can do it quite easily using a rational curve passing through a line. So if you have a rational curve on x, v, sorry, passing through q, you will have that the alpha, the, the approximation constant of q on v has to be bounded above by the approximation constant on L. So producing rational lines, rational curves uh, passing through your point is a way of bonding from above this uh, approximation constant. And actually, if the curve is very free, well, somehow you can deform it by fixing your point Q, and you will get uh, a dense open subset and using this, it's not too hard to show that you, can, you get a bond on the generic uh, approximation constant, which will be okay, L, which will be less than alpha Q L. So a way to compute them, or at least to have a bound on this, is to um, produce rational lines uh, passing through your point. That's mainly the strategy of the proof uh, in the cases where Dijon dealt with historic varieties. The last thing I might say on rational curves is that somehow we expect, by combining Mike Keenan's conjecture and this, we expect the alpha, the generic approximation constant, to, uh, I mean, if, if you get that the essential constant is, let's say, uh, mu, you expect that you will get a very free curves on your uh, variety passing through Q of degree smaller than mu, of small degree, smaller degree. So somehow uh, we expect, assuming McKinnon's conjecture, that if you get information on this uh, essential constant, you should be able to get some very free curve passing through your point. And the last thing I want to mention before going to our theorem is the link with the local version of Manin's conjecture. If you know how to say something on the local version of Manin's conjecture, you can get information on this uh, essential constant, and hence conjecturally on uh, rational curves passing through your point. So if, so it's a yeah, proposition, let's say, if for a zoom factor R0, we have equidistribution, then the essential constant has to be bounded uh, above by this R0. Somehow, studying the local uh, version of Manning's conjecture also goes kind of both ways, also gives you information on the essential constant. This is precisely the kind of information we will get in our uh, theorem. 
All right. So yeah. Uh, so let me go to our uh, result. So we wanted to see what the circle method could uh, tell uh, on this uh, local version of Manin's conjecture. So we um, will take V hypersurfacing Pn smooth given by a homogeneous integer polynomial f of x is equal to zero. And to simplify uh, things, we will assume that the point Q is in uh, V of Q. And we can always do that by a, ch a linear change of variable, that the tangent space at Q uh, is given by xn is equal to zero. So this is just to simplify uh, everything. And uh, we will take for rho the chart uh, where x zero is uh, not zero, of course. And so we want for this um, hypersurface uh, to study the local version of Manning's conjecture. So what's the counting problem we uh, want to estimate? So we have to estimate for epsilon one, epsilon n bigger than zero, because as I said, we can't restrict to characteristic function of uh, intervals. So you want each of these factors to be small. So let's say smaller than one uh, epsilon i. And so what we want to estimate is the following counting function, which is number of okay, x zero, x n, and z n plus one, such that, so I will forget the coprimality condition here, such that f of x is equal to zero, x naught is less than b, and all of the xi will be less than b to the minus one over r, x zero, and yeah, epsilon i. So if you apply the setting of the local version of Manning's conjecture I explained earlier, you just get this counting problem. And so the theorem we are able to prove is the following. So Assume, of course in the circle method you have to have enough variable. So assume that n has to be bigger than two to the d times d minus one. So here's the first difference with the classical uh, circle method that we don't have n plus one, but we have d. So there is somewhere in the proof, I'm not sure I will have time to explain, but where uh, we have to impose one more variable to be able to get an asymptotic formula. And we have a second condition is that our result only works if r is big enough. So r has to be bigger than some function of n and d. So I don't want to write the explicit formula, but to give you a, a sense of what this function uh, looks like, if you take d, uh, which is approximately uh, two to the d times d minus one, then you get uh, that the function g, g and d looks like d squared. And if you take n to be much larger than d, as large as you want, uh, then you would take you would get g and d of size uh, d roughly. Okay, so we have to impose enough variables. We have to impose that our zoom factor is not too small in terms of n and d. And then, so maybe I should write somewhere else. Then we manage to prove an asymptotic formula for the counting problem, which actually proves uh, equidistribution. Okay, so we have, 
proven that n epsilon b is equal to uh, the alpha in a pairs constant when you are studying Mannion's conjecture. I put it the beta even though it's one in our case. Then you have the product of the periodic uh, densities for uh, your variety. So this part is the same as Mannion's conjecture, same as in Mannion, the global Mannion. And the only part where you get something changing is the uh, Archimedean part. And for the Archimedean part, you get the product of one to n minus one of two epsilon i. If you, b, yeah, sorry, I don't know why, <laughs> x and x and b, thank you. Uh, and this is just the volume of uh, rho of the bow of, uh, okay. Let me just say it because I don't have too much time. So you, you're counting in uh, all the xi. Maybe I should write it down. So we, we're using this zoom factor. And you project that inside the tangent space, which has equation no, where it's written xn is equal to zero, and then you take uh, the volume of that. And that's how you get this. So somehow you can see this as the Archimedean density of just the equation of the tangent space. There seems to be something happening with the, the equation of the tangent space in the Archimedean places. And then we have the right power of b. So here we didn't use the anti-canonical height function, so that's why we have this power here. Uh, but uh, this is the power predicted by, uh, by the conjecture of Zijon. Then we don't have any uh, power of uh, log, and uh, we, we end up with uh, some error term in the end. So in other term, we have equal distribution. And we have a two dimension, uh, not a two dimension, uh, so corollary. We have uh, n minus one dimensional measure which is absolutely continuous to, with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So we have equidistribution as predicted by, uh, by Zijon. And hence, following what uh, I mentioned, I don't know where, around here, we did use that the alpha essential of Q has to be uh, finite. And you can get a bound which is given by, by uh, where is it, by roughly this G of NB. Okay, so I guess five minutes. I'm not sure. Then are we start? Maybe over there. So yeah, maybe let me say first uh, what we would like to improve in this result, and then if I have time, I will. mention a few elements of the proof. So we got this finiteness of this uh, alpha uh, essential, which is a priori not obvious at all for generic hypersurfaces. And if you believe in McKinnon's conjecture, this should uh, tell you that you should have very free curves on your generic hypersurfaces of degree less than G of ND passing through uh, your point which is also not obvious if you want to construct an explicit rational curve of a given degree passing through your point. So, possible improvements that we have in mind is uh, so this, born, this bound on R is of course not optimal at all. It comes from a technical choice of parameters, but we probably can't improve it that much. But the good thing is that this uh, essential constant does not depend on the choice of the distance. So, so far I only used Archimedean distances, but maybe we could try to 
zoom on a point with respect to some periodic distance. And if you do that and you, if you're able to improve the bound on R here, you will improve the bound on uh, alpha essential here. Maybe we can try to use uh, periodic uh, distances. And the other question we're thinking about it is what should be the value of uh, alpha essential uh, of Q? So we, we don't have really il any illusions. I guess we're probably really far from the, from the real value. But uh, what should be the, the, the real value? The only results that we uh, found so far in the literature, but maybe we are missing uh, something, is due to color. And it tells you that if V is Fano of rank, Picard rank is equal to one, you can find there is a rational curve on V. Uh, very free of degree less than uh, n minus 1 times n over n plus 1 minus d. So we can compare our bound with this bound. Of course, our bound only gives conjecturally very free curves of a given degree, but so sometimes we do better and sometimes it does better. I, th I think it's, yeah, yeah, well, be because, uh, yeah. I think maybe they don't write the page. Oh, it's over an algebraic equation. Okay, so my bad. Yeah, okay. But even if you expect, yeah, to, to, to be on the underground, yeah, sorry. Okay, and so I guess I will not say uh, too much about the, the second method and stop here. Thank you. Thanks for that lovely talk, Kevin. Um, any questions in the audience? Yes, that's something. Maybe they don't will, because you, you have some examples where you have a thin subset to remove, right? So this is missing in this. Yeah, I guess it. Yeah. <laughs> you might. We, we have examples where we have a thin subset. Yeah. But then it's unclear how to define the right uh, function. At least for varieties like hypersurfaces, we would expect that this should not happen. Any more questions? Yeah. If you believe the Zurich the approximation, usually you're better approximated. But uh, yeah, we haven't really tried anything in that direction. I would expect better approximated. If that's all the questions, uh, can we give Kevin another out or something? Yeah. It's here, well, yeah, it's a bit hidden now. <laughs> we have this asymptotic formula using circle method. <laughs> okay, yeah, so if there's no more questions, uh, let's give Kevin another round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>